A Christian may be saved, may be full of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, biting devils, doing all kinds of miracles. If their mind is not renewed, their character is not transformed. If their mind is not renewed, their character is exactly what it was before they knew Christ. So that this is a believer who says they are born again, but their actions are not born again. They'll come speaking peace, peace to you, and, but he says, don't believe them because inside they are talking about a sword. They are double tongued, they are vipers. The person is preaching the gospel, the mind here has verses, but down deep here is iniquity that is going on. So though you hear whatever they are saying, they have never been renewed, and the treasure in their hearts has been destroyed. And that is why Jesus wants to cleanse the heart. If you purify your heart, there is attraction. You are going to attract good in your life. You are going to attract God bless, God's blessing in your life. The walking in God's power and God's blessing is going to be easy. Righteousness will always reign. God reigns in righteousness. And when your righteous acts are on the outside, there is no way you'll miss good in your life because God is going to be there with you. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways. I want to share, uh, purify your heart. God is looking for a pure heart. Uh, God is looking for a pure heart in the church. Blessed are the pure uh, in heart, they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. And not just at the end of the age, uh, when we all come to the judgment throne, they will see God in this life. They will see God tomorrow. They will see God on Monday. They will see God in their families. They will see God in their finances. They will see God in everything that they do. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, I want us to understand why and how a heart needs to be purified. I'm born again. I'm saved. Uh, my life is changed. I'm saved. I'm headed to heaven. What are you talking about when you say that the heart needs to be purified? If I'm saved by grace... Then where does this thing about heart purification, where does it come from? And please, Pastor, this morning, don't give me any cliches. Explain to me so I can understand. Romans 12, verse 2, the Bible says, And do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of the mind that you may prove an acceptable and perfect will of God. And I talked about the issue of being transformed to be new and why we don't need to be conformed. And I, as I was defining being conformed, being conformed is taking the shape of whatever you are poured into. That means you are not reflecting who you are on the inside or underneath there. You are reflecting something else. And that's why he said, don't be conformed to this world. So he's saying, be who you are on the inside. Be holy, for I am holy. Because God lives on the inside of me, I, I ought to be holy. I ought to reflect that. So being conformed is a, like water that is poured in this container here. I can take this water and pour it in a jug. I can take this water and pour it in a glass. I can take this water and pour it in a cup. And every time I pour this water, it reflects the shape or the form of what I pour it into. It's conformed to that shape. It conforms to that form. And the candle, candle wax does the same. Anything that is liquid will do that. When you pour it, it takes the shape of the container. That means it doesn't show its real character. It doesn't show that it flows. It cannot be compacted. It's, uh, it's, it's not solid. It doesn't show that it takes the shape of another. And when Paul tells the, the Roman church and he says, do not be conformed to the system of this world, what he's telling them is that Romans, you people, the Christians in Rome, be who you are on the inside of you. Be who you are in your spirit. Do not be what you want. You are trying to become now. Be who are in your spirit. And he's trying to tell them so that they can reflect who God actually wants them to be and who God made them to be. And so uh, he's saying here, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. And he says how? How is by the renewing of the mind? And I, I remember us sharing that a Christian may be saved, may be full of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, 
binding devils, doing all kinds of miracles, if their mind is not renewed, their character is not transformed. If their mind is not renewed, their character is exactly what it was before they knew Christ. So that this is a believer who says they are born again, but their actions are not born again. And we know that we do not have a shortage of that kind of person in the church. But having pastored for a long time, I know that many Christians, though their character is not right, they have a desire to live right. They have a desire in their hearts to be pure. They have a desire in their lives to be transformed. They want to be seen as Christians that live a holy life. And so what happens is that they, this has produced a, a level of Christianity where a lot of Christians are really hypocrites. When people call us hypocrites, but really we are sometimes guilty because we live a life, one way of life, and we live that life on the outside, but we want to show like we are holy and we want to show like we are, but, but we are struggling on the inside. And I want to just uh, share with us uh, some few verses here. Matthew 22, verse 36, the Bible says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So this is what the Bible says as the greatest commandment. This is not the greatest commandment of the Old Testament. This is the greatest commandment in the New Testament. Jesus, the Savior himself speaking. So this is not part of the law. This is not part of Moses. This is not part of the Old culture, Old Testament, Old law. This is the New Testament. He says, love the Lord your God. And if you pause there, he says, with all, not some, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. What does he mean with that? What does he mean with that? The first man that you see on that image is the man we normally meet at Walmart, is a man people see, it's who you are looking at. That's me. But inside, I have a few different components of me. That is, I have a physical body that you can shake hands with, that you can interact with, that can speak, that you can see. That is the one you can see. Inside of that man, is what we call the soul, the soul. God formed man, he breathed his spirit into the man, the man became, became a living soul. The soul of man is his mind. It cannot be seen with the physical eyes, you cannot touch it. The soul of man also has the emotions of man, so that your emotions are part of your soul. And also it has the will. You have a will, some has a, a strong will, some don't. You have a will that says, I am willing to do this. I am willing to do this. I like this. I don't like this. That's your will. And everyone has a free will given by God. That is in the part of your life that is called the soul. And also there is another part of you that is called the spirit. And so let's go back to this verse. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, he says. He says, with all your soul, and so it's also he says, with all your mind. So if you go to the middle man there, the person there that is called the soul, he's saying, love God with all this, that whole part of your, of your life. And that is with the emotions, with the mind. And then also he says, with the heart. And so I want you to understand what those things are, because unless you understand that, you will never understand renewing your mind. Renewing your, Jesus was alluding to that. That's what Jesus was teaching. Paul was just explaining it a little bit more. The soul is the mind. The soul has emotions. The soul has the will. The spirit is a totally different because the spirit is the one that gets born again. The day you got saved, the old spirit that was there, that was in bondage to sin, that you could not resist, that was governing your life, that was in bondage to the devil, that spirit was taken away and you were born anew and you received a brand new spirit that is pure and holy, that loves righteousness and Jesus came to live in that pure uh, uh, spirit and that's where he dwells in your life. So the spirit lives actually inside of you 
and that spirit is pure and holy, every born again Christian, even those that live a very bad life, have been given by God full righteousness and a clear and clean spirit they do have in, their, in them. But the soul is a whole different entity. The soul was not born again. Your memories were exactly the same. After you were born again, your heart, your mind, your thoughts, everything, you never forgot anything when you got born again. And that is the part I want us to talk about. And uh, number one, I want you to understand that the mind of man is made of two distinct and very different parts. I'm going to not talk about the emotions. I'm not going to talk about the will. I want to talk about the mind, renewing the mind, purifying the mind. And I want to explain what that is. The mind is in two clear different components. The mind has two components. One is the mind as we know it that actually engages the conscious thoughts that we have, the conscious mind. Your conscious mind is where you think from. It's the things, when you see something, when the eyes see something, when the ears hear something, that, is whole, that whole thing is processed and that, that data is dealt with in the conscious mind. When I'm thinking about you, I'm thinking about you in the conscious mind. That is where thoughts actually dwell and that is where the immediate temporary thoughts uh, dwell there. Now, but underneath is all in the subconscious level is another major part of your mind and majority of your thinking, majority of your data, majority of your memories, majority of your stuff is in the subconscious, in the subconscious mind. So you have the conscious mind and the subconscious mind and that subconscious mind is what is called the heart. Anytime you read the word subconscious, I want you to read the word heart. When God says your heart is not pure, what he's saying, your subconscious mind is not pure. When God says this, is, let me just uh, use an illustration to show you that you have two levels and two different places of the, of the mind, of the mind, the conscious and the subconscious, or the mind and the heart. They are two different entities. Let's say, for example, I'm at Walmart. And I'm just doing my ordinary, normal shopping at Walmart. And around the corner, I meet somebody. And I look at this person, not with mask, but I look at this person without a mask. And I say to myself, I know who this person is. We smile, we shake hands. And I feel, I, I cannot remember this person, but I do want to remember this person. And I say to myself, and so we shake hands, we talk, and we say, hi, hi, I've not seen you in a long time. Yeah, I, I not no long time. And I so and we go our separate ways. I'm embarrassed to ask them where we met and where I saw them. And so I go my way. But I keep saying to myself, where did I see this person? And then it's around eleven o'clock, eleven eleven, and I forget about it, and I continue in my business and I continue doing other things with my conscious mind. I go back to work and I continue working, and somewhere around three o'clock. I've not been thinking about this. All of a sudden, the image of that person pops up in my conscious mind. I say, wow, that's where I saw him. In that place, he helped me and at such and such a place. And that's where we met. And I feel like I can even call him. And I say, now I remember. Now, what was going on all this time from 11 to 3? It was not going on in the conscious mind. But in the subconscious because the subconscious realizes that I need that information, has been going through all these images, all this data, everything that is there, every file, every file, every file, just checking for this image, for this face, until it came up with the image in the memory and it showed up in the conscious mind. So I say, I remember. That means the data has come to the mind from the heart. It has been extracted from the heart. And so this is what I want you to understand. Whether you realize it or you don't, you have two levels. The conscious mind is up here. Uh, conscious mind is what actually you are looking at in the diagram as up here. It is a conscious level. It is where actually your thinking happens. But underneath, there is what we call the heart. It's not the pump. It's the heart. It's the subconscious mind. And that is where... All you are, Dada, everything you have, every face you have ever seen since you are a child is in there. 
everything, nothing is ever deleted. Every image, every person, everything you have ever seen in a train, in an airplane, traveling, going anywhere, every person you've ever met, every item you've ever seen at Walmart, it's in there, it's stored in there. That data is stored. And, and just to digress a little bit, that's why people do, the people who do hypnosis are able to do something with your mind and, and they take you back to 10 years ago. And they will say, 10 years ago, or when you are 10 years old, what do you see around you? And you see people remembering and crying like babies because they remember because that data has been extracted from down there. And so let me go back and just tell you that the heart has every fear, every secret and private fear you have. The fear for divorce, the fear for being broke and poor, the fear for failure, they are stored down there. Every secret memory, it's down there. Everything that you actually believe, it's down there. Every conviction is down there. That is where all doctrine is taught. And that is where decisions are made. Decisions are never made up here. Decisions are made down there. And that is the root of all decisions, good or bad, they are down in the heart. And Jesus talked a lot about the heart. Jesus was not concerned about what you are saying with your mouth, what you are doing on the outside. He was concerned with what was going on in the heart. And he actually, we are going to read a lot of verses about that. And I'm going to just show you that that part of your mind, that is the subconscious mind, which we are going to call from now going forward, we are going to call heart. The heart is very important. And the heart is the part that you are supposed to be dealing with. It is a... is that that submerged environment of thought. It is where beliefs are. That's where your beliefs, what you believe is not what you tell us. It's not what you say. It's not what you are thinking about here. It's not your analysis in the mind. Your beliefs are down there. And I'll just show you what the Bible says. Let me give you an example that we can work with. And this example I'll give you from Psalms 14 from verse 1. The Bible here says, The fool says in his heart, The fool says in his heart. Where? In his heart. The fool says in his heart. There is no God. And he says they are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. And there is no one who does good. So while this person is worshiping. While this person is telling people I am born again. While this person is telling everyone. I am quoting verses. Down deep in the heart is another message. They actually don't have a conviction that God exists. They don't have a conviction that God sees everything. The mouth says, I believe God. The mind actually can see what the Bible says and quote the verses. The mind actually can see the world around us and say, there has to be a God somewhere. But the convictions of the heart is that God is a dormant entity or God doesn't exist or God doesn't see or God is dead. That's what is in the heart. And if you uh, put up the diagram there, uh, the image four, uh, so you see this person says, I am a Christian. I am a Christian. I believe in God. I am actually, some will even say, I'm born again. But deep down, they say, God is not real. God is not real. I don't believe in God. There is no God. There is no hell. There are no consequences for my sin. And because if and when you believe there is a God who exists, you will not hide from people to go and do something wrong. You will not hide from people to go and fornicate. You are not going to hide from people to watch porn. You are not going to hide from, because God exists and you know it and you are convinced of it deep in your heart. And so you can say with your mouth, Whatever you want to say, but unless the conviction and the belief that is on the inside changes, you will not behave in a manner that shows that you fear, you feel there is God. And that's why he says here, the fool says, where? In the heart, not with the mouth. With the mouth, the fool is saying, I am a Christian. With the mouth, the fool is saying, I'm born again, I go to church, I'm religious. But deep down in the heart, there's a whole different story altogether. And that is something that actually happens a lot. What is in the heart of man and what actually is in down, deep down there 
even especially for those that are born again, you have to understand your spirit is new. Your spirit has been renewed. The old man is dead. But there is something that is called a body of sin. The body of sin is different from the old man. The body of sin, it's not a body like a physical body. It's like you can talk about the body of truth, the body of evidence. The body of sin is what is called the mind. That, that is, that's what is called the heart, which has a lot of data about your past. Every evil video you have ever watched, every scene, every bad movie, every profanity that you have ever had, it's stored in there. Anger, malice, murder, everything that is evil and vile is stored deep down in the heart. And when it's stored deep down in the heart, it is what the devil keeps coming back to try to arouse and bring back and use it so that it can control the body so that the person that is born again can continue walking in the flesh because it's also called the flesh or walking in sin. That is what is called the body of the flesh, the body of sin, and that is what needs to be renewed or removed. Otherwise, if that iniquity continues to working from there, it is going to destroy the life of the person. The person who lives by the law, when they see all those memories, when they see all that data, and they see the temptation to sin that is coming out of their heart, what they say is that, let me remind myself of what the law says. So they go to the letter of the law. But for us that are in grace, what we do is we know that it cannot overpower us. We don't have to give in to, into it. And we come to ask Jesus who lives inside of us to help us by the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome. And we receive that overcoming power that already dwells inside us so that we can say no to unrighteousness and we can buy the power of grace. Say yes to the things of righteousness. That is the life of grace, and that is how it's different from the life of law. Let me go back and talk about the works of the flesh are in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, um, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, self-ambitions, and dissensions. Now, as I read this list, I'm trying to hurry through it, but as I read it, do you see those things among Christians? That is the flesh. Do you see those, some of those things are lacking and moving and staying and they dwell inside of the holiest of us. They are in there and we have to find the power to defeat them. Evil thoughts are going to come to any person, especially if you are already introduced to those thoughts and they are dwelling on the inside. The enemy has a way of coming and through his own wickedness, being able to arouse those thoughts so that they can influence your life. Heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, leveries, and the like, of which I tell you be beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so, whether your spirit is clean and holy or not, if by the power of, your, of the Holy Spirit inside your life, you do not, if you do not bring the, those powers, those memories to death, and you bring them down, you are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. This is where the gospel of uh, grace that is a license, this is where the biggest error of that gospel is here. Telling people that just because your spirit has been given righteousness, full righteousness, you just stay dormant and wait and continue in sin, Jesus is going to redeem you. What I want you to understand, you have that righteousness for a purpose, that by faith, Jesus can live out that righteousness in your life so that your character changes, that you are not going to walk in the flesh. Those who walk in the flesh, those who fulfill the deeds of the flesh shall die. But those who mortify the deeds of the flesh by the spirit shall live. The life of the flesh is death. The life of the spirit is life. And that's where it's different. You cannot be guided by those things and you cannot be guided by that thing that is evil in the heart. Let me go back and talk about the evils of the heart. And uh, I, I, excuse me if uh, this message today sounds like it's a little bit on the other side, on the negative side. If, I do not, if you do not know the problem, you are not going to want the solution. And I've come to the place where I believe most of you that come to watch 
and come to the service and worship with us here. What you want, you want God. You want the word of God. You don't come for a little soup. You come here for meat. You come so that you can be built. You can become everything God wants. You don't want me to soothe you to, to hell. You want to go to heaven. And I'm here to tell you that truth is that that heart needs to be cleansed. We are fully capable. We are fully able. But your eyes have to be open. And you have to have a willing heart. So that you can have that cleanse and wash. It can be renewed for the glory of God. So what is evil in the heart? Why this evil in the heart? Let me read a few verses. Uh, because that is the only. The, the one thing about the soul. And the spirit. Is that you cannot see them anywhere. Nobody can see through your soul. Even the greatest of prophets, they can lie to you. If they say, I see you are sold, they don't. Tell them they lie. That is God's prerogative. Nobody can see your spirit, nobody can see your soul. That is hidden from view. But you know you are soul. You can tell what is in your spirit by the word of God. It's God who shines his light. And when he shines his light in your spirit, then you can see the fornication. Then you can see the evil thoughts. Then you can see the anger. Then you can see the dissensions. Then you can see all those things that actually are evil and of the flesh that needs to be removed from your heart. So Titus 1, verse 15 to 17, the Bible says, To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and their consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit uh, for doing anything good. Why are they unfit for doing anything good? Because in the heart where decisions are made, there is nothing good that comes from there. Decisions are never made from up here. Let me give you an example. If you, God forbid, but if you went to a place and uh, your kid was inside the house and was in danger, or you were just outside somewhere, and inside the house, you see a snake just go in, and your kids are in there. Your brain here says, it's dangerous. Don't go in there. Don't try to go in there. But your heart says, I do not care whether I live or die. My child is in there. The reasoning here says it's dangerous. The reasoning here may say, that's fire. You not both survive. The reasoning here says one thing. But people have to hold you back if you're not going to go into that house. It is the heart that makes the decision and is the heart that decides for us. Amen? Let me give you another example. Have you seen people who drink and smoke? A lot of them, they lead what is on the packet. It says, cigarette smoking causes cancer. Okay? They know that. Some of them are doctors. They know that. So the brain has the information. They are very smart people, very intelligent. But the heart has a whole different story. The heart is corrupted. The heart has to eat up this stuff. The heart is thinking something else. The heart says, I need it. I look good smoking. I look good drinking. The high is what I need. And so they follow the heart. And do not follow. They end up following the heart and do not follow what is up here. So this up here is temporary. If you have wonderful thoughts about this message, it's temporary. Unless it goes in the heart, it will not change your life. That's why you have a lot of Christians, they behave exactly the way they behaved before. You knew they would fight you before they got saved. After they got saved, you know they will fight you. You know they will deal with you. And so that's what Timothy here is saying. They claim to know God where? With their mouth, with their conscious mind. They have verses in their conscious mind. But the heart is corrupted. The heart is evil. The heart has some things going on that needs to be dealt with. In Psalms 36, transgression, you hear that word? Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. Where does transgression speak? Deep in the heart. It's wickedness deep in the heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes. So if you have the image uh, three there, it shows the heart. In, in the heart, what are the things in the heart? In the last days, the Bible says people are going to be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, irreconcilable. Those are the things that are moving down deep in the heart. 
That is what is going on deep in the heart. And so you are talking to somebody, they are about to divorce, they are about to separate, you are trying to reconcile them, but deep in the heart is that spirit of the end times that is making people irreconcilable. And this has not spared pastors, it has not spared anybody, people that you cannot reconcile, you cannot bring together, they cannot agree on anything, but yet these people can even, can still, will tell you, I care for him, I care for her. They'll still be able to tell you that they do, yet the heart is messed up, there's wickedness that is in the heart. And this wickedness keeps speaking to them. Go ahead and watch that video. Go ahead and do this. Go ahead and do this. Go ahead and watch that video so I can fill you, your mind with junk. I can fill your heart with junk. Go and watch this so that I can take you to the next level so that you can go and do evil and do something that is bad. So that, that, the wickedness of the heart speak to you and in your life you think that this is your thinking and these are your thoughts that are evil, yet it's wickedness that is speaking from down deep in the heart. Transgression speaks from there. That is where transgression actually dwells. That is where wickedness dwells because it has come and bonded itself in the body of sin. And that's why Paul was saying, the things that I want to do, I do not do. And that means it's not me, but something else. What he was referring to is the wickedness that is in the heart. And he's saying, that has taken over my life and that has controlled me. Who will deliver me? And then he talks about Christ and how Christ comes to deliver those that are born again. And he comes and reveals himself as the truth. So transgressions is the wickedness that stays in there. And I'll tell you this. You can feel holy. We can feel very holy. And, and God is working that out in all of us. We are at different levels in our progression to holiness. But what actually lacks in within has to be highlighted by the Holy Spirit. You, ha you have to be enlightened by him. You have to see it and you have to be before God. Like David was saying, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. He had an idea or wh whether he was speaking prophetically, he had it in the New Testament. Exactly what we need in the New Testament, the right spirit and also a clean heart so that our heart can be cleansed so that we are not going to walk and dwell in evil. Listen to the following verse. This verse is the cry and prayer of a lot of Christian men and women, and I'll read it for you. It says in Psalms 40, verse 11 to 12, Do not withhold your tender masses from me, O Lord. Let your loving kindness and your truth continually preserve me, for innumerable evils have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me. This is the psalmist himself. This is a person who loves God. He's writing songs of the kingdom. This is a musician. This is a worshiper. This is a person that actually worships the living God. He's writing for God. But he, what he's saying is, you are loving kindness and truth. May they follow me because innumerable iniquities surround me. Innumerable evils surround me. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I am not able to look up. That means I'm still worshiping. I'm still singing your praises. But around my life, is so much iniquity, I am ashamed I cannot look up from the ground. And he says, the more, they, are, they are more than the hairs of my head. And he says, therefore, my heart fails me. And this is what I found in the church. A lot of people, because of how they are overwhelmed by temptation, by iniquity, by sin, because of how they are overwhelmed, they get to where their heart faints within them and they feel, I am hopeless. I will never be delivered of this. This thing is a yoke that I'm never going to get out of. And if it's anger, if it's um, uh, malice, if it's jealousy, those things can literally sit on top of somebody's heart and they can be a destruction that actually can destroy somebody's life. So Jesus, this, is, this is the psalmist. Some of these things, because they're in the Old Testament, some of us will look at it and say, let, let me hear from the New Testament. And so let me show you in Matthew 15, verse 16, the Bible says, so Jesus said, are you also still without understanding? Are you also still without understanding? Do you not understand? That whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated. They were trying to bring the issues of the law to him. And he's take, say, telling them, just forget. If you eat something, it will be eliminated from the body. And that, that's, that's really graphic when he says it this way. But verse 18, he says, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from where? They come from the heart. And they defile the man. So you are defiled from what is within the heart. Those things we were pointing to. From the man, that, that, from the body of sin. From the thoughts that are deep in the heart. 
from the memories of those things, from those things actually that have made a stronghold within their hearts, within the hearts of the people. And he says, those are the ones that defile. And he says in verse 19, this is a great revelation. He says, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, proceeds murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. That tells you that fornication doesn't come from the outside. Fornication is a thought that comes from within. And it springs up and you start thinking about it. And it just speaks to you. These are the transgressions that speak to you. And what you need to be able to say every time that that is not me. That is wickedness speaking within me. That is not my thoughts. Those are, that's not my voice. That is wickedness speaking within me. I am not uh, born, bound. I have no debt to that thought. I cannot walk in that way because God has delivered me. And so uh, these are the things which defile a man, he says in verse 20. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So what he's saying is, in your law, you say we have to wash hands ceremonially. After we do this and that and before we eat, that is a ceremonial cleansing that you take soap and you wash with soap. But after you are clean from, with that, you come to another religious cleansing. And he says, that will not defile you. Washing your hands is not going to, actually, not washing your hands will not defile you. What will defile you will come from within the heart. It will come from down deep within the heart, and that is the thought. And being, being honest, no, you cannot be healed unless you are honest. Being honest is saying, there are things that bother me. I was not a saint in the past. Those things are deep down there. I have seen things. I've done things. But there's also wickedness that has been added to it. And those things that are in my heart, in the, my subconscious mind, I'm going to deal with them and remove them from my life. And walking by the Spirit and not walking by the flesh actually gives you victory so that by and by, day by day, your transformation is clear and everyone can say that you look more like Christ as you live your life. Matthew 12, verse 33. He says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. This is Jesus saying. So he's saying, if you make the tree good, you are going to have good fruit. If you make it bad, you have bad fruit. He says, for a tree is known by its fruit. And he says, brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Amen? So now, when Jesus calls people vipers, some people think Jesus was being vulgar. Have you noticed that from the pulpit, people have become more vulgar? They could call you any name, any name, because they hear Jesus say something. But listen, why did Jesus call them vipers? It's because... A viper is the only animal that has a double tongue. It has a tongue. When the tongue comes out, it looks like one, but it has two of them. A double tongue person is someone that will say one thing, but the heart is different. A double-minded person is, here are verses, here is iniquity. And that person should not expect anything from the Lord. Double tongue is that these people being evil, they will mention the law of God, but at the same time they will come and accuse Christ and say that he's coming from the evil one. They are double tongued in all their ways. That's why in Jeremiah the Bible says they will come speaking peace, peace to you, and, but he says don't believe them because inside they are talking about a sword. They are double tongued. They are vipers. They are two ways. They are not one way. They are two ways. They are not, and, and you know that that's a sickness that is in the majority of the people. You have to deal with that yourself, your own self. If you don't and you project it on other people, you are going to be left without transformation. But I believe that this church, all nations, is a church that will have a pure heart and God is going to help us so that we are going to cleanse our lives, that in walking in our lives, just as much as God has blessed us in other ways, we are going to see righteousness reign and we are going to become ox of righteousness in God's house. That that is something that is going to be seen. And it's not going to be a struggle for us. It's not going to be condemnation. It's not going to be by works lest we start boasting. But it's going to be by the grace that God gives us so that we can actually become everything God wants us to become. Matthew 15. I'm just trying to show you some of the problems that actually are in the heart. Hypocrites, he says in verse 7. Hypocrites. He says, well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth. And honor me with their lips. But what does he say? But their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines 
the commandments of men. And this is the church of our day. This is a church of our day where there's worship going on. But among the people that are worshiping, that's why you'll find in some of the largest congregations, you'll find the worship leader stands up and says, I don't believe in God. Have you seen them? Big, great artists this year and last year. A lot of people have made announcements. Some people that have written books to the young people talking about, um, you know, uh, I said goodbye, bye-bye to dating and stuff like that. Yeah, people like Joshua, I think is Joshua Harris, and uh, they come back and renounce and say, I don't believe in God. Pastors have stood before their pulpits and say, I don't believe in this thing anymore. How come pastors today are still being accused and walking away from pulpits because of iniquity? It's that wickedness springing from the heart. The person is preaching the gospel, the mind here has verses, but down deep here is iniquity that is going on. So though you hear whatever they are saying, they have never been renewed and the treasure in their hearts has been destroyed. And that is why Jesus wants to cleanse the heart and he wants to change it. And this is uh, Jeremiah 17 verse 9. The Bible says the heart is deceitful uh, above all things and desperately wicked. And he asks who can know it and we know that the Lord can know it. But the flesh is that accumulation of thoughts in the mind, in the heart. It's, it's also the body of sin. That is the flesh. And removing that from your heart. Removing the flesh from your heart is what is called the circumcision of the heart. The true Jew is not who is physically circumcised. The true Jew is whose heart has been circumcised. That is, the works of the flesh have been cut away from their life. That is a true Jew. I just want to show you um, some things about how God reveals this iniquity to us. James 4, the Bible says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That means come to him and he comes closer to you. And what happens? He, he calls us to cleanse your hands, you sinners. And he says, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So does this word make sense? Double-minded in that you have one mind up here, you have the other mind that is not conscious. It's two, those are two different minds. He says, you double-minded, this is what you do. Purify your heart. Purify the heart that is on the inside so that whatever it springs forth, it connects with the mind uh, that is out here and your actions are going to have integrity. That means they are working together and that's where the integrity is. Jeremiah 17, verse 9, the Bible says again, um, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperate wicked. Who can know it? He says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways. Remember when Samuel stood in Jesse's house and Eliab came, the firstborn, he said, this is God's anointed. He said, I have rejected him. I don't look like you. Men see the outside. I look at the heart. What is he talking about? He's saying, I'm looking at the treasure in the heart of this man. And that heart shows up when David is there confronting Goliath. That heart shows up where, when this man is saying, you, can you go back and look at the little sheep that you look at? This man was an evil man. He knew probably David was going to bring salvation to Israel in this thing. And David had already been anointed for it. But this man is just consumed in jealousy. This is what was in the heart. That's why God said, I look at the heart. I don't look at the outside. In Psalms 139 verse 23, the psalmist here is crying out saying, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. Try me and know my anxieties. And uh, Psalms 73 verse 1, Truly God is good to Israel to such as are pure in heart. And what he's saying there is that if you purify your heart, there is attraction. You are going to attract good in your life. You are going to attract God bless, God's blessing in your life. The walking in God's power and God's blessing is going to be easy. Righteousness will always reign. God reigns in righteousness. And when your righteous acts are on the outside, there is no way you'll miss good in your life because God is going to be there with you. And Psalms 51 verse 10, he says, Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me, change me. And in those days, those are the days of the Old Testament, but this man could see from the distance. And Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. It's the heart 
It's the heart. And it's the heart of the matter. And if our gospel does not go into the heart and change the heart, we are going to have a superficial gospel, and that is what the religion that the devil wants on the face of the earth. It's not new. It has been there. And I want you to know that that's the religion that the devil wants. And they have a form of godliness denying the power that dwells within us to help us overcome sin. Dwell within us. He dwells. It's Christ within that actually is the answer to the issue of a clean heart. It's the Christ that is within us. But let me read for you Ezekiel 20, 36, verse 26. This is what the Bible says. I will give you a new heart. This is the promise of the New Testament. He says, in, the, in those days, I'll make a new covenant with Israel. I'll make a new covenant. This is what Christ came to do. Many people never connect that covenant that actually is prophesied uh, in, in, in Ezekiel. They will never connect that with the covenant that Jesus came to uh, ratify and ratified by the blood. In this new covenant, he says, I am going to put my word, my law, I'll write it in their hearts. I'm going to give them a new heart. There's something that he promised. This is not cliche. These are not just words. God cannot promise something that he doesn't deliver. And that's why when Jesus died on the cross, he died so that he can give us his righteousness. He can come and dwell with us in our spirit. He lives there. And that is where he comes and gives us a new heart from there. And he gives us a new spirit. He has given us a new spirit. He's working in us as we walk with him by faith. He cleanses our hearts so that we'll have a new heart. And in this new heart, we don't need an outside law, but in this new heart, he will wash us and no one will need to tell us that this is God and this is the way of God. He, Christ within will show us what is not right. And as he searches us from within, we are able to correct ourselves and we are able to walk in the righteousness. Whether you went to school or not, whether you have a Bible or you don't, you are able to live in righteousness. The early saints didn't have a Bible that we have. They didn't have the canon. Most of these churches had one letter. The Corinthians had one letter. And I think they also read the letter for the Laodicean church. They didn't have much of scripture. They didn't have books that are written. Yet these people are able to live better lives than most of us. With all the Christian material that is there. Because it's not what is on the letter on the outside. But it's the Christ within that actually gives you the victory that you need. He said, I'll give you a new heart. And I'll give you a new mind. And that is the promise that he has given to us. Colossians 1, 27, to them God wills to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, if, you, if you have that, that Bible is yours, this is the word that I want you to underline. Colossians 1, 27 is one of the most important verses in the Bible to me it never gets better than this. This has been one of my best verses in the Bible. The revelation of this word in my life is responsible for everything that I know, everything that I am, and everything that I have. Outside this understanding of the mystery that Christ is in you, and Christ lives in my life, and Christ has come, and he dwells there, it's not a concept, it's not an idea, but it's a reality. He dwells and he lives in my life. And by faith, I release whatever he has taught in my life, the victory he has. And as I release this by faith, I am able to walk in the power. So Christ within, Christ in me, and Christ dwelling in me is the hope of glory. Psalms 119 verse 11, he says, your word I have hidden in my heart. And that, he starts that very well saying, oh, how can a man, a young man, cleanse his ways? How can a young man, in the day we are living in, of social media, of t phones, of all the junk, of the biggest, one of the biggest devils in our time is YouTube. That is one of the challenging things on the face of the others we speak today, is what we have on YouTube. It's not just like the... The, the tree of good and evil is a tree of evil and good. There's more junk. Even when you go to Christian material, there's more junk in Christian material than, of course, like half of our prophets that we believe so much. More than, not half. 90% of our prophets lie to us. They lie to us. 
And uh, Christian, don't, don't change the subject. Don't change, don't delete that. They lied because for sure God never spoke to them. He never spoke to them. Yet they told us God spoke to them. It's not a mistake. It is intentional. It's the devil. It's intentional. You cannot just stand before people and tell them one thing. Well, so they say one thing from their hearts. They say one thing in their mouth, but their hearts are far from God. And their hearts are different. And so I want you to understand the mystery of Christ within makes the difference. And he says, I have hidden your word in my heart. It's your word in my heart that is here that makes me not sin against you. I've come, renewed my spirit. I've renewed, I've re, not my spirit, I've renewed my heart, my subconscious mind. I have taken out all the thoughts of the flesh, all the works of the flesh, and I've replaced that with the word of God. I've hidden your word inside my heart, and that is what causes me not to sin against you. Not anything I have on the outside. Not trying. It's not my fasting. It's not my works. If it's my works, I'll boast. If it's my works that I got victory over this, I'll boast about it. There's power in fasting, but fasting has a purpose. It is power that comes from knowing the mystery of Christ within. It's a mystery. And a mystery is like when you go to watch a, a movie. I'm not suggesting any, but when you, you watch a movie and you find they start with someone that is on the floor. Well, they are full of violence, but it starts with someone on the floor. And this is a detective series. And the detective is looking around. The person who killed is right there. You are seeing them throughout the movie, but you didn't know. So it's something you are seeing. So it's a mystery. You are seeing the person, you are seeing everything, but it's not yet revealed to you. And this is a mystery of Christianity. Christ within. Christ in your heart. Christ in your heart. That is the mystery of Christianity. You miss that, you'll never make it to heaven. You miss that holiness is an idea. You miss that you will never see the kingdom of God. Christ within, Christ in you, the hope of glory. There is no glory. There is no hope of glory without knowing Christ lives within you. And so 2 Corinthians, this is the last verse that I'm going to read. 13 verse 5, it says, examine yourself. This is Paul. He says, examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. He says, test yourselves. Test yourselves. He says, do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Is it, isn't this obvious? Don't you know that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. If you do not know Christ dwells in you, you are not going to make it. This is the mystery and this is the answer to our sanctification. This is the answer to our walking and living the life of holiness. And this is what I want our young people to know. This is what I want our youth to know. This is what I want our single young people to know. This is what I want to every couple to know because unless you know Christ within, you are going to be irreconcilable. Whatever actually is the small problem of your family, no one will be able to reconcile you. But you learn ways of going to church and just worshiping and looking like you are born again, yet deep within inside of you. There is a demon, there is a, a, a wickedness, there is a transgression that dwells within you that actually makes you that no one can reconcile you to that which God has given to you. And I, unfortunately, as I share these things, I know a lot of people. This message is directly to us. This is not what we throw to another church. This is our message. This is our message. We can handle this. This is our message. And we can look at it and say, I wish I got something else. No, this is the source of blessing. This is the source of life. This is the source of peace. This is the source of everything good. If you take this as a young person, your life will be changed. You take this as an older person, the years you have left are going to be meaningful and are going to be fruitful and you're going to do glorious things for God. You take this message, it will transform everything that you are. It is a gospel that have at the center the cross of Jesus Christ and at the center 
is Christ crucified and coming to live within us. And that is who God has made us to be. May God bless you. And I hope that you know that deep inside of you, the man of sin needs to be removed, needs to be purified, needs to be renewed so that the mind of Christ can be manifested, manifested within us. We have the mind of Christ, we, that we can be able to say that and not say, talk about the man of sin who has actually kept many in captivity. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be able to share this message. It's only you that can make this message a revelation that we can live by. The Christ that dwells within us, open the eyes of our understanding that none of us will be found dull of hearing, blind in our eyes, that we are not going to be darkened in our understanding. Now, Father, this message is going to be a treasure that we find. We are willing to sell everything we have so that we can get this treasure right inside of our hearts. Oh, Father, change us, change us, change us, transform us. Help us realize Christ dwells within us. That we can live in the consciousness of this every single day of our lives. That this can be manifested in the different places where we work and where we live. That Christ can be seen effortlessly. That people can see you are light shining through us. That our works can so shine before men that they may glorify our Father who lives in heaven. Help us, Father, that we are going to know this, to walk in this power, and to live out this life. Lord, I pray that no one will feel condemnation, but the conviction of the Spirit will lead us to our knees, will lead us to want to know more. Put a thirst and a hunger for this righteousness, the righteousness of grace. Put it deep inside our hearts. Now, Father, we are going to stay awake, thinking, searching the scriptures, searching after you, and calling on you so that you may change us and transform us. This is the way we want to live and walk in our lives. Help us, our God. Help us, our Father. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise. Father, open the eyes of our understanding. I want to pray for every person, wherever you are listening to this message, I just want to pray for you. Let's just lift up our hands before God. You are at home, just lift up your hands. I, I want to ask, Father, that you are going to pour your spirit. Pour a new light upon us. That Christ be formed within our hearts. Open the eyes of our understanding. Make us not just willing, but willing and able to do of your good pleasure. Help our hearts. Help us that mighty God, we will have a pure heart, a clean heart in your presence. Father, as a church, we'll be a people of a pure heart. But Father, when we gather, we are not going to be saying one thing and our hearts showing a different thing. The mighty God, we are going to be transformed by your grace and by your power. And that work continuing day by day, day by day, that Father, our light will shine like the dawning of day to the perfect daylight. The mighty God, you are going to transform us and that the path of the just and the righteous will be seen inside our lives. Cause that light to happen in us. Cause the spirit who lives within us, Father, to flow new levers of living water from out of within us that we can be washed and cleansed, that our hearts can become everything that you desire for us. That that power will be given to the strongest and to the weakest among us, to those that are flailing, to those that are weak, to those that are failed and to those that are doing well, that each one of us, King of glory, will receive a portion of that power. And mighty God, we can walk in that genuine power that you provide from within us. That the mystery of Christ within can be given to us to open our eyes to understanding. We give you praise.